Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. Before we begin today's session of the Hindu analysis, there are a few announcements that you must listen to. First, Baiju's is bringing to you the national scholarship test that gives you a chance to win up to 90% scholarship on the Baiju's IAS courses. This online test will be held on 17th of April at 11 am. The link to register for the test is given in the description of the video. The deadline to register for this test is the 16th of April till 6 p.m. So do register to see how prepared are you and get a chance to win amazing scholarship from Baiju's IES courses. Next, this Friday, that is tomorrow, we have the weekly explained session where we will be discussing in detail what is happening in Sri Lanka and every aspect of the Sri Lankan economic crisis. As you know, this session goes on live at 8 p.m on our YouTube channel of the Baiju's IAS. Next, we also have the third episode of the mnemonics and mind map series coming up tomorrow. That is Friday at 3 p.m. Tomorrow, we will be discussing specifically history related mnemonics and hacks that will be extremely useful for you for your prelims examination. So do tune in for that also tomorrow at 3 p.m. on the Baiju's IAS YouTube channel. Now let's begin our session for today and the first article today is focusing on a problematic disease in India that is extremely widespread that is diabetes. The authors here are saying that while all our focus in the past couple of years has been on the pandemic and other communicable diseases, the fact remains that the entire world is facing a big problem of non-communicable diseases as well. These diseases include diabetes, diseases related to obesity, hypertension, heart diseases, etc. In this article, specifically, the focus is on diabetes in pregnant ladies and the impact that it has on the child that is born from the diabetic ladies. The authors here say that in year 2021, the prevalence of diabetes across the world was estimated to be over 53 crore people. And the estimate is that by 2045, across the world, over 78 crore people will be living with diabetes. Now, the interesting part is that these are the people who have been diagnosed with diabetes already. But you know in our country that there are a lot of people who would have high blood sugar level, who would have diabetes right now, but they have just not diagnosed it. Because in India, we are very averse to having ourselves tested. You don't really go to a doctor or you don't really get yourself tested for health unless there is something extremely wrong with you. And that is why, not just for diabetes, for many other diseases in India, we come to know of it very late and because of that, a lot of people have to spend a lot of money in getting themselves treated because we are not in a habit of having our frequent health checkup done. That is why it is said that for every person who is known to have diabetes, there will always be at least one more person who already has diabetes but it has not been detected in the body. Apart from that, there are many other people who are yet to approach the stage of diabetes but they are suffering from high blood sugar level. Those are called the pre-diabetics. So, we are just talking about the diabetes numbers across the world that are so high. We are not even considering right now the number of people who are pre-diabetics and the number of people who have diabetes but have not been detected with it. Now, there are a lot of reasons why the number of people suffering from diabetes are increasing not just in India but all across the world. One, aging population. Second, urbanization. Now, the reason why urbanization is mentioned here is in a rural economy, people are used to doing much more physical labor even in their day-to-day -day life as compared to when you are living in an urban area. You are a lot more dependent on your machines. Let me give you a very simple example. In most of our homes, we still have switches where you have to get up and switch off the light, switch off the fan. Increasingly now, however, we have smartphones, we have smart bulbs, we have smart fans, we have smart TVs, meaning that you do not even have to get up from your bed or your sofa to switch off that light before you sleep. You just have to use your mobile phone, put a button on the mobile phone and it will automatically switch off your light. It is called smart bulb, but in reality, it is actually making us more lazy and not smart. Because of the advent of all this technology, especially in urban life, the physical activity that is undertaken by the people is on a decline. Then another reason is the genetic predisposition, meaning that diabetes is something that gets passed on from generation to generation. 
there's a very high chance that if a mother had diabetes at the time of giving birth to the baby, the baby would also be directed with diabetes at some point of time in his or her life. Then there's nutrition and lifestyle, how you conduct yourself. All these together have meant that the number of people who are suffering from diabetes in our country and in other developing nations is increasing day by day. While these factors have been talked about and written about considerably, the one factor that has been ignored, which the authors here have mentioned, is diabetes during pregnancy. Now, pregnancy-related diabetes can be of two types. One, women who catch diabetes during the pregnancy stage. And second, women having pre-existing diabetes. Let us take both of these collectively and not separately. And let us call them hyperglycemia in pregnancy, that is HIP. As per the authors around the world, if you see the number of women who are giving birth to the child, about 16.7% of them are suffering from diabetes. That includes women who had diabetes during pregnancy or the women who had diabetes already before the pregnancy. The number of such women is 16.7% around the world. In India, that number goes up to 25%. So one in every four women who is giving birth to a child in India is actually diabetic either catching diabetes at the time of pregnancy or before that, which is much higher as compared to the world global average. And there is a proven science behind it that the mother that has diabetes will most probably get it passed on to the child as well. It was in 1980s that an experiment was conducted by the British physician and epidemiologist who said that a man's susceptibility to a lot of diseases has already been programmed even before the man was born because when the man was inside the mother's womb he was taking all the characteristics from the womb of the mother for example let's say if the mother was suffering from high blood sugar levels that means the fetus would also detect it because the fetus would get the same blood as is present in the body of the mother High blood sugar level means that the pancreas of the fetus would secrete much more insulin that is required so that they can counter this high blood sugar level. That means because of high insulin, there may be much more fat deposited on the growing fetus, resulting in the baby being born of a bigger size as compared to the other normal babies. So when you have a baby that is born of a bigger size, in most cases that is because the mother had high blood sugar levels. This can also pass on from generation to generation, especially if the person who is diabetic is a female. Now, this is a problem statement. Now comes the solution. Can we control this problem or not? Or what can we do about it? As per the authors, the one way to beat this diabetics is to make sure that we are keeping a very close eye on the blood sugar levels of pregnant ladies. In fact, as soon as the stage of pregnancy starts, the women's blood sugar levels should be taken into consideration on a very regular basis. And the doctor should try to maintain the blood sugar levels as close to the normal levels as possible. And that should be done for all the pregnant women from the very early weeks of pregnancy. This is the only way in which we can ensure that we can break this chain of high blood sugar levels going from one generation to the other generation. Now the unfortunate thing is that this is not the first time or the last time that we are hearing about diabetes with respect to India. In fact, India is regarded as the diabetes capital of the world because of the number of cases of diabetes that are found in India at a very very large scale. There have been multiple reports pointing towards the reasons and the types of diabetes that are seen across the world, including India. Now, in 2020, there was a research report published titled Lifetime Risk of Diabetes in Metropolitan Cities of India. Let me share with you certain findings of that report. That report said that more than half of men, that is 55%, and about two-thirds of women, that is 65% women, aged 20 years in India are more likely to develop diabetes than other people of the same age who are living outside India. Also, most likely, they would develop type 2 diabetes. Now, majorly, there are two types of diabetes that we see around the world, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 diabetes is also called as juvenile diabetes because it mostly affects children up till the age of 14 to 16 years. Now, type 1 diabetes simply means when the body does not produce sufficient insulin. People who have type 1 diabetes means that they have to get insulin from external sources and they get artificial insulin daily in order to stay alive. Then we have the type 2 diabetes. 
type 2 diabetes means that the insulin that is produced by body is fine but the problem is that the cells in the body are not responding to the insulin in the way that they should. This is the most common type of diabetes and this results mainly in obesity. The report also said that women generally have a higher lifetime risk of developing diabetes across their lifespan as compared to males. Now a number of causes have been mentioned in the report. These are almost the same as the ones that are mentioned in the article that we just discussed. Increasing urbanization leading to a more sedentary lifestyle, decreasing quality of diet, a lot of things that are contaminated are now going inside our body and also much lesser level of physical activity in our day to day life. All this is all this information about diabetes has been asked by the UPSC both in the prelims and in the mains examination as well. The next article here is a very interesting one and is based on India China relations. The author here is saying that the Chinese foreign minister made a surprise visit to India a few days back and this presents a very interesting view of what is happening right now. On one hand US has been sending its representatives to India to talk India out of supporting Russia. On the other hand India is sticking to its neutral stand in the Russia Ukraine crisis and now we see China sending its foreign minister to an unplanned visit to India. The author here through his article is trying to unfold what is happening in India and why is it that a lot of international dignitaries are coming to India every single day. He is saying that India has emerged as a very important country which is why a lot of countries across the world are trying to rope in India into their corners. We have seen a lot of dignitaries coming into India in the past month or so. However, that has not changed India's stand at all. India is still sticking to its neutral stand and is still continuing to buy oil from Russia and has been looking for ways to conduct its trade with Russia without depending too much on the dollar. Now this presents a very interesting view with respect to China especially. Here are a few things that you need to understand. Out of all the foreign dignitaries that came to India, the only one who got a personal meeting with our Prime Minister Mr. Modi was Russia's foreign minister. That did not go well with the Western nations. However, that gave a very interesting signal to China. China in the past few years has always been blaming India that India's foreign policy is dependent on the American foreign policy. That is, India sees the other nations just like America wants us to see them. But what is happening with Russia-Ukraine crisis right now is that India's foreign policy is not in line with the American foreign policy. In fact, interestingly, China officially praised India's foreign policy just recently, saying that India has taken an independent view of the ongoing crisis, which is very appreciable. So what do we make out of the present situation right now? Let me try and simplify this for you. Let's assume in the middle of it is India, which is being attracted to come towards the side of US. So US president and most of the US diplomats have been extremely accommodative of India's stand. Except one or two representatives, that is a deputy NSA that came to India who spoke very harsh words against India. Not a lot of high ranking officials of the US have criticized India. In fact, they have been very accommodative of understanding India's view of buying our defense supplies from Russia. They have not even talked about bringing back the CATSA sanctions for India's S-400 missile defense system. So in a way, USA is trying its best to ensure that India comes towards its corner. Now what is India doing? Rather than responding to them, we have read their message but we are not responding to them. We are in fact sending a message towards China. Now why do I say so? All the India and China troops right now are face to face in thousands at the LAC. But all the indications are that India is looking to improve its relationship with China. Why? First, India has never spoken anything against China's human rights record, be it in the Xinjiang region or what is happening in Hong Kong. Secondly, there were reports that India in fact told the US diplomats also that when they were coming to India, they should not make any statement against India-China relationship or what is happening at the border. Thirdly, the India-China trade is also at an all-time high. All these things now indicate that India is more interesting in getting a response from China rather than responding to the call of the US. So I can very easily define it to you by using a line in Hindi and then I'll translate it in English also. In Hindi there is a funny line, Jisko hum chahiye, wo hume nahi chahiye, aur jo hume chahiye, usko hum nahi chahiye. If I translate that in English, that means the person who wants me, I don't want him 
and the person who I want, they don't want me. This is kind of a situation that we are seeing right now in terms of India, China and the US as per the author. As I told you earlier, there are many indications from India's side that it wants to now be more accommodative of the Chinese stand. For example, we did welcome the Chinese foreign minister. We did not make this demand that we first want to end all these issues on the border. In fact, Indian government in the past few months has not made any statement of the current status of what is happening at the border. Although the soldiers of the two countries are face to face right now. And in fact, the Chinese foreign minister recently made a statement on Kashmir as well. But we have chosen to ignore that and be more accommodative of what is happening in China right now. And the interesting part is that China has not returned us this favor. For example, after the pandemic has slowed down, China has allowed the students from South Korea and Pakistan to come back to its university and colleges, while China has still not allowed 23,000 Indian students studying in their universities and colleges to come back and join the college. That is why there are conflicting signs coming from the two sides. India's trade with China has also reached a record high of $125 billion. As per the author, the problem seems to be that India believes that it would be much more beneficial for us to have a healthy relationship with China as compared to having a healthy relationship with US. We believe that China has much more to offer to us with respect to what is happening in our neighborhood as compared to having a distinct friend in US. That is the only way that we can justify how the government is acting right now. While the US president keeps on saying that India, being the world's largest democracy, should be in support of America, that is the world's oldest democracy. But as per the author, maybe the problem is that now under Prime Minister Modi, India's concept of democracy might not be the same as the American concept of democracy. And maybe that is why the two sides are not being able to come to a common point where they can take a common stand on the ongoing crisis. Now, as the article mentions, the India-China bilateral trade is growing at a record pace and it has already reached $125 billion. All this despite the fact that the government of India had announced banning of a lot of Chinese apps. Also, the government of India announced that they will not want to have any Chinese telecommunication equipment for the 5G trials in India. Even with all those restrictions, the India-China trade has been growing at a breakneck speed. And maybe this is why the government of India has realized that it is always better to have better relationship with China because ultimately for a lot of our industries, we are still dependent on China for their cheap imports. Amidst all the ongoing problems, the one positive sign was that when the Chinese foreign minister visited India recently, he also made a statement that India and China are partners rather than rivals. He also said that China would be open to starting a new virtual summit with India called the G2 summit in which both the sides can come together, discuss their issues and play a vital role and form a partnership for Asia's development. Now this seems to be something that will be taken up in the future once the border issues are resolved but it does seem that the government of India is right now being more accommodative of China rather than being confrontational with China. The next article that we have focuses on India's solar power and the fact that India might not achieve the solar energy targets that we had set for India ourselves. This article is based on a recent report that is jointly prepared by two energy research firms called the JMK Research and Analytics and the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. Both these firms together have written this report according to which India will miss the 100 gigawatt solar energy target that we had set for the year 2022. Although we have made amazing progress since 2011 to 2021, but the ambitious target of 100 gigawatts does seem to be a bit out of reach. Now, if you remember, the earlier target that India had set for itself was just of 20 gigawatts under the Jawaharlal Nehru National Solar Mission. However, in 2015, realizing the potential that India has, the government revised the target and set it to 100 gigawatts by 2022 and then 300 gigawatts by 2030 as per the announcement made by the Prime Minister. Now the fact is that India is doing pretty well in the field of solar energy. If you see nations across the world, India ranks 5th after China, US, Japan and Germany in terms of the total installed solar capacity. But the reason why it is still disappointing is that India has a potential to achieve a lot more as compared to what we have done right now. 
as of December 2021, India's total solar power installed capacity is about 55 gigawatts, which is about half of the total renewable energy capacity that we have in India and 14% of the overall power generation capacity of the entire country. Now, since the target was for 2022, the report says that in one more year, we are expecting that India might add 19 gigawatts more of solar capacity. So 55 plus 19 would still be only about 74 gigawatts. Means India will still be short of about 26% of its target by 2022. The report says that the major reason why we have not been able to achieve the target is because a rooftop solar target that is a rooftop panels that have to be set up across the country on residential buildings or commercial buildings. That particular target has not been met. We thought that we will achieve 40 gigawatts of energy by solar rooftop. But of that, there is a shortfall of about 25 gigawatt. So almost all of the shortfall that we will see will be because of the rooftop solar target that has not been achieved in the country. So what exactly is the reason why the rooftop solar target has not been achieved? As per the report, there are many reasons for that. The first biggest reason is because of the pandemic, there has been a major disruption in the supply chain. Now, most of the components required to build a solar panel are imported from outside and they are not really made in India. So India is dependent on other countries for the supply of the components of solar panels. And this supply chain was disrupted because of the pandemic. Although the good part is that with every passing year, many more people are understanding the importance of solar energy and more people are now embracing it. As a result of this, technology cost is coming down because many more people are installing it now. Also, because the orthodox power supply into homes is becoming costlier, people are turning towards solar. There is much more awareness also about cutting energy costs and also because it is environmental friendly and we are seeing people becoming much more aware of that issue as well. However, even then we have not been able to achieve the target. Apart from the disruption in the supply chain, the other reasons also include that there are still a lot of regulatory roadblocks. Now, it's not as easy as going to the market, buying a solar panel, putting on top of your house and then using it. If you actually have to install solar power, that means that you have to make a substantial financial commitment to it because it is not very cheap. The other reason is that the government has allowed the people to generate power from solar panels and if there is excess power, means they can use the power at their home and if the power is left, they can sell it to the government and the government will pay to them. For all that to happen, the government needs to set up infrastructure of setting up meters, deciding the cost, etc., signing agreements, all that is not being done at a fast pace. Because of which we are still seeing that the adoption of solar power is much slower than what we had anticipated in the past. Now the fact is that the solar power is a major component of India's commitment to address the global warming and the targets that we have to meet that we announced at the Paris Agreement or the Glasgow Summit, all of that can only be achieved if we are back on track with respect to our solar power generation target. For that to happen, the government has to ensure that all these roadblocks go away as soon as possible. Now, one of the things that the government has done from its side is this rooftop solar scheme. This has been running from the side of the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, which has allowed the households to get rooftop solar panels installed by themselves or a vendor of their choice. Now, because they are costly, the government has come in between to subsidize that. As for the scheme, you just have to take a photograph of the installed system and you can avail the benefits of the subsidy under this particular scheme. Earlier, you only had to choose a vendor from the government side, but now all that you have to do is click a photo and register for this benefit and you will get it. Under this scheme, the government is providing 40% subsidy in the first 3 kilowatts, 20% subsidy after 3 kilowatts and up to 10 kilowatts of solar panel capacity. All this is being done to ensure that generation of solar energy becomes a norm in India and people are not averse to spending their money in setting up these panels because in the long run, their cost will be much lower. This is just one example of a government initiative being taken in this regard. If you go to the website of Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, you will see that all these are initiatives that the government has taken. If you actually click on this button on the website, you can see a one paragraph description of all these schemes. 
and I would highly urge you to visit it and make a note of most of these schemes because solar energy and renewable energy as a whole has been a hot topic for the government and for the UPA. All these schemes are relevant and do read about them. These are the other schemes which are for solar off-grid which are being run by the government of India. Again, there's a paragraph of information available on the website of Ministry of New and Renewable Energy about all these schemes that you should study. The next article is about what is happening in Nepal. Now, the news articles are filled with what is happening in Pakistan and Sri Lanka, but little did we know that there is an economic crisis going on in Nepal as well. The problem started when the Nepal Prime Minister recently sacked the head of Nepal's central bank. The reason was that there was a lot of problems between the finance minister of Nepal and the head of the central bank of Nepal about how to deal with the ongoing economic crisis. The crisis is simple. That is, Nepal's foreign reserves are coming down considerably and have reached $9.5 billion in the month of March as compared to $11.75 billion that they were in July 2021. As per the experts, the foreign reserves that the Nepal government has is just enough to pay for import bills for the next seven months. Now, the fact is that yes, this is a problematic situation, but not as bad as what is happening in Sri Lanka or in Pakistan. The reason is that Nepal does not have a lot of foreign debt as those two other nations have. But the bad part about Nepal is that they don't really produce anything of their own and they're highly dependent on imports for even the most basic commodities, be it oil, milk, food and many other commodities. And that is why there is a lot of problem in Nepal. Also, because of the lack of supply of these essential commodities, there is also double digit inflation that will be seen in Nepal very soon as for the local economists. Now, why is it that Nepal has been pushed towards this? See, since 2020, when the pandemic started, the one sector across the world that was hit the most was tourism. Any nation that is dependent on tourism for most of its GDP had a major trouble coming out of the pandemic. That includes Nepal, that includes Sri Lanka, then nations such as Mauritius, Maldives, Seychelles, all these nations that depend on tourism are having an extremely hard time in reviving their economy because the number of tourists coming into their country has still not reached the earlier level. Add to that the increasing global oil crisis because of Russia-Ukraine problem. Then the number of remittances coming in have also declined because just like other nations in Asia like India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, a lot of people from Nepal also used to go to developed nations, work there and send remittances back to their houses. But again, because of the pandemic, there has been a lot of job losses and thus the remittances have also declined. And all that has compiled into one big problem for Nepal. For example, take the oil sector. So Nepal's primary supplier of oil is the Indian Oil Corporation. And Nepal, through the Nepal Oil Corporation, pays money to Indian oil in two installments every month. There's an installment on the 8th and 23rd of every month. That is a gap of 15 days. Now, for the latest installment that has to come on 23rd of April, the Nepal Oil Corporation did not really have enough money. And there was some trouble here because they did not have enough foreign exchange. But the Nepal government decided to help them out. And at least the money to be paid to Indian Oil on 23rd of April is sorted. But how long will it continue and will the government be able to keep on supporting the Nepal Oil Corporation remains to be seen because they don't have a lot of foreign reserves left with themselves right now. And with a landlocked country like Nepal, which is always dependent on its neighbors for help, especially India, we have seen in 2015 also when any shortage of fuel can lead to a big crisis within the country. And as per the experts, this can happen again in the coming days. The other interesting problem in Nepal here is that the elections are approaching. Now, elections are approaching means election in a democratic country is always an exercise that requires a lot of money. So because the elections are approaching, the government of Nepal has to spend a lot of money. Earlier, whenever the elections used to happen in Nepal, because it's a democratic country, there were organizations across the world such as the US aid that used to help Nepal financially. But this year, they are not expecting money from those organizations as well. Again, because of the pandemic and lack of money in these organizations as well. So the government of Nepal now has to finance all this election. And that again has become a major point of debate within the country. As in, from where will the government of Nepal get all that money? Although people are saying that the problem started 
because of the fight between the finance minister and the head of the Rashtra Bank of Nepal. But the real problem is much bigger as we just discussed, which started from the pandemic itself. Now, if you see the newspapers across the world, you will see that Nepal is taking a lot of desperate measures to improve their situation. For example, just a day back, Nepal government limited imports as a foreign currency reserves are now dwindling at a very fast pace. So in order to ensure that forex reserves don't go out of the country, most things cannot be imported by the Nepali citizens now who are living in Nepal. Then, as I said, the tourism problem has been reported widely. In fact, Nepal's famous newspaper Kathmandu Post reported 2020 was the worst year for tourism since 1986. And tourism is a sector that makes up for a lot of forex reserves in Nepal, which is why the problem has compiled. Same with remittances. They have been declining considerably because the people have lost their jobs overseas and they are not in a position to send back the money that they were earning earlier. These were the articles we wanted to discuss on the Hindu newspaper today. Now a couple of practice questions. Number one, assess the progress made by India in building solar power infrastructure in the past decade. How close are we in realizing our solar power generation targets? Second, what are the different types of diabetes that affect the human body? Elaborate the reasons behind the increasing number of diabetes patients in India. Both these questions have to be answered within 250 words each. Thank you so much for watching the video.